Hi, everyone. Yat A, welcome to CHSN Hour. Uh, we're honored today to have Dr. Alice Chen with us. Um, Dr. Chen is connected to us through our vaccine campaign funder, Made to Save. She's a, a senior advisor there um, on all things relating to COVID and vaccines. Um, and so we're, we're very excited to have her. Uh, she's also plugged in to what's happening nationally at the federal level uh, in terms of, of COVID and vaccines. So we're, we're very lucky to have Dr. Chen here with us today. And um, first, I'm just gonna remind you all um, who I am, Shae Ethel Branchian Chef, Nipotoni Nishlin, Nakai Bushes Chin, Simajini Dasha Che, Don Nakai Dasha Nella, Sezizi Denasha. And I'm speaking to you from Kintana, uh, more or less at the base of Dokoa Sleed. Um, and I'm uh, very happy to be here with you. I'm the executive director of Yeha Almida, which does business as Navajo and Hopi Families COVID 19 Relief Fund. And of course, has a uh, hashtag protect community vaccine campaign underway um, from the due to the generosity of made to save um, and so again we're happy to have Dr. Chen here with us and Dr. Chen if you'd like to introduce yourself and share a little bit of your background with our viewers that would be wonderful. Sure hi everybody it's so great to be here thank you Ethel for inviting me you may say you feel honored I feel honored <laughs> to be invited in because I know that you know, your, your, your community has been doing so much um, through this whole pandemic and, and organization has just been um, such, a, so, such an incredible partner with us. And we feel very, um, very inspired by the work that you do every day to, to support the community. Um, I am an internal medicine, medicine physician, um, but my more important title is mom. I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old that I've been navigating through the pandemic with. Um, I live in uh, Washington, DC um, and grew up in California. Um, and, uh, and I'm just very happy to share anything that would be helpful to you all to know. Um, and uh, I'll start off with a few uh, slides, but then we'll just have a, a conversation. Happy to answer your questions. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, so I will start, let's see, it's loading. So I'll just start with kind of a little bit. So, as we all know, we've been in this um, we've been in this pandemic for a couple of years now, and had this you know unexpected winter surge um, that 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 happened because of the Omicron variant. And I'll just start kind of globally. So, in terms of where things are sort of internationally, the global cases are averaging about three million per day, which is about stable from last week, but it's a really incredibly high number. Um, deaths are averaging about 8,000 per day um, worldwide, which is a slight increase from last week. We are seeing cases starting to peak in, US, in the US and much of Europe, um, but rising in Latin America, the Middle East, and, and many parts of Asia. Um, we do expect most of the globe to peak in January, February, because this is a very fast up and, 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 and fast down um, sort of surge. And, and these maps are just sort of the change from last week. So the darker the, the, the color, the, the higher the infection rate is. Um, in the U.S., kind of zooming back into the U.S., so our current search has peaked nationally, which is great news. Um, the cases peaked about a week or so ago, um, and we are seeing some pretty sharp decreases in early states. Here in D.C., we are at about 25% of where we were when we, we were at our peak. Still at higher levels than we were before the surge, um, but it is coming down pretty quickly. Um, New York City is at about 20% uh, of their peak. Um, there are definitely some states and some more rural areas that are still seeing rising cases. Um, in terms of hospitalizations, our new admissions have also peaked, which is um, uh, a good thing because we our hospitalizations are still at a record high. So like the total number of people in the hospital with, with COVID is a, a little over 150,000 people um, around the country, which is pretty incredibly high and has definitely been sort of straining our hospital capacity. But fewer people every day are getting admitted to the hospital. So we should be seeing that number um, nationally coming down. And we're certainly seeing it come down in some of the early places. In terms of deaths, we are seeing a little over 2,000 deaths per day. Um, and that is still rising, but it is expected to peak soon. Um, that is a number that I always look at. I think, man, if more people were vaccinated, we would not be seeing that. Um, and so that's always kind of the, the, the bottom line number that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about. 
Oh boy, I just feel that way about the pandemic in general. <laughs> How friend did it need to be a threat if you get vaccinated? <laughs> I know, I know. Um, in terms of the four corners, so it does look like you, um, Omicron has peaked in uh, all four states, um, which is which is good news. And hopefully, that 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 coming down will look as 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 sharp as it, as it has looked in other places. Um, and we'll kind of see where that where that ends up. Um, we do have recent new data from the CDC about how well vaccines and boosters um, are working. So in the month of December, so those hospitalizations were kind of a mix between Delta and Omicron, but definitely saw some Omicron there as well. Um, we saw that people who are fully vaccinated, um, if, so if you're un, uh, unvaccinated, you are 16 times more likely um, to be hospitalized than somebody who is fully vaccinated. Um, and even among teenagers, sometimes people will say, oh, well, the teenagers, they really need to be vaccinated. So that's the number is nine times higher um, uh, risk of, of hospitalization if you're unvaccinated. Um, if you look at the rates of people who got boosted, um, so in December, if you compare people who are fully vaccinated and got a booster um, compared to people who are unvaccinated, so in that 50 to 64 year range, it was 44 times higher. Um, risk of, of hospitalization and 49 times higher for people who are 65 and older. So we're definitely seeing that those vaccines are, um, are doing their job and people who are unvaccinated are still, um, are still at risk. Um, there have been some shifts in terms of who, uh, how, when you qualify for a booster. Um, so this is a couple of weeks old, but I'll um, sort of like uh, uh, tell folks here. So, um, so with the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, vaccines, if you've gotten your primary series, which is the first and your second shot, um, and it's been five months um, since your second shot, then you are ready for your booster. Um, so that is eligible for people 12 and up. Um, for the 12 to 17, that's only Pfizer that you can get. Um, and then for Johnson & Johnson, it's if you finish your primary vaccination, that one dose um, more than two months ago, then you're ready for your, for your booster. Um, and for any of these, you can get um, any of the different um, uh, vaccines, the Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson to go with your primary series. Um, the CDC is recommending either the Pfizer or the Moderna over Johnson & Johnson at this point. This is really, really helpful because I feel like this information is constantly in flux, at least in the past few months. So. <laughs> Um, and of course, you and I had chatted earlier, you might hear a small voice in the background. I have a little toddler here. Usually hey. he's often my co-host, so he may make a, an appearance here. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm just like anxiously awaiting the opportunity to get the little guy vaccinated. Um, and, and, you know, we still don't have anything for um, the small children um, under five, but um, yeah, so I mean, this is dedicated to boosters, but I, I feel like I need, <laughs> I need a chart like this that addresses the boosters and the primary series. And then with the young kids, it could get, get even more complicated. I'm hearing that um, it, they may recommend three shots as the initial series. So thank you for breaking this down in a simple <laughs> manner for us. Yes, of course. And I'll just pipe up here because I have a I have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. The three-year-old also can't get vaccinated. The five-year-old is. And man, I'm just waiting every day for that news to come from Pfizer that they've wrapped up that trial. But I have no more insights than anybody else. Just waiting, 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 waiting. Um, uh, just a few more, more notes um, on tests and masks. So in the month of December, it felt like everybody was looking everywhere for tests and couldn't get any, um, and that is getting easier um, and 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 easier. So um, last week, the federal government launched COVIDTests.gov, um, which um, allows every household to get to um, ask for four free uh, rapid at home test kits. Um, and then the US Postal Service has been shipping them. They already started shipping them last week. Evelyn, we talked about it. You already got yours. Yeah, I requested mine on Monday. Um, we had uh, early access for our constituents and our staff because of the work we do. And I had received it by Saturday. It, it possibly arrived before Saturday, but I'm enough of a on that millennial edge that I don't do normal mail. So 
it was unusual for me to check my mail <laughs> at all. Uh, but I wish I had been checking it closely because I really was not. I mean, all of the advertising said it would take them seven days to even drop it in the mail, but I received it in, you know, at least, you know, five days, um, which was shocking and amazing. And it came perfectly because we had had an exposure through my niece who um, goes to the local middle school and they've had exposures. I, you know, I look at my email from Flagstaff Unified School District and every single day for the prior week, we'd had an exposure in her grade, in her grade level. Um, and they allow the kids to switch classes, you know, and they're asking the kids to social distance, but adults don't even know what six feet looks like, much less a middle schooler. Um, but anyway, so I actually opened it and used it immediately. And it was really phenomenal because that was the second rapid test I had used. The first one, I just had written instructions. And I will say that visually it was very helpful, but it was very stressful because it's like, oh my God, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. And I feel like I'm going to mess this up somehow. <laughs> so it was kind of stressful going through that first experience. But with the, um, the test I received from, from President Biden, you know, it was through iHealth and they actually had a step-by-step -step video that you could utilize. I mean, it did require you to download an app, and I'm just hopeful that all of our people have access to that um, who receive these tests. But, um, you know, and, and they broke it into like four different videos. So um, it was pretty user-friendly. Um, so you would watch like one little video and get one phase set up, and then you would move on to the next video. And even like at the video point where you need to start paying attention to timing, it set an automatic timer for the 15 minutes and the, an alarm went off at the end of the 15 minutes. So it was just really a pleasant and less stressful experience than I was expecting. Um, and, and fortunately, of course, the results came back negative. So that was really great. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend that people access this. And I also just want to say that um, prior to um, basically Sunday, these tests were only going to be allowed to be shipped to residential addresses, but um, Dr. Chen played a pivotal role in advocating on our behalf with her contacts in the White House and was able to get that changed so that we could receive these at PO boxes, which, you know, most of our people receive their mail in PO boxes. So if, if this had not been opened up to PO boxes, it would have excluded much of Navajo Nation, as well as much of Indian country in general. So thank you, Dr. Chen, for that. Oh, well, it was, it, was, it was you bringing it up <laughs> that allowed me to just pass it along um, up, the, up the chain. I will say that the, the White House and the Postal Service have been very responsive um, to any issues that people are having. So if you, um, if you, if you go on the website and you can't, uh, it, it says you, you can't order tests, you actually just um, call the post office or you fill out a form on the post office website and they are being very quick at sort of resolving any issues. Um, so if there are you know, multiple households that live at your PO box or that use the same PO box, you can call them and let them know we have multiple households and see if they can resolve that. Oh, really? So, oh, wow. Because I did get um, some questions from folks asking like, well, what if you have a uh, household that's large, a very large household? It wasn't clear that it was, you know, multi-generational home um, or, or what the situation was, but it sounds like maybe there is a fix if they contact the post office. There is, if you, if you have a, a large household, typically they're only doing that for those four, four tests um, to start. So they had kind of the, the initial allotment of, of 500 million tests and there are 122 households in the country. And so they have like just enough for every household if everyone requests one, um, but there are more tests coming. And so I think there will continue to be sort of ongoing efforts to make sure that people who need tests can get them. Um, I'll also say that Clearly, not everybody has access to internet, and it's 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 not you know easy in all places. So there is also a call center. You can call this number one eight hundred two three two zero two three three, and they do have interpreters in one hundred and fifty languages, so that you can place their, your order through them as well. That is super helpful. I I was not aware of that phone number, so thank you for sharing that because a lot of our people do prefer to utilize the phone. Like we have a for our isolation assistance, we offer an online sign up form as well as a hotline number. And I think most people call the hotline number. So this is very helpful. We will definitely elevate this and make sure that our constituents know about this resource. Yes, okay. please do.
Um, in addition to getting tests, those four tests uh, per household, you might burn through them very quickly because you know your niece <laughs> is going jumping through school. Um, there are other op uh, testing options as well. So both Medicaid and private insurance are reimbursing up to eight at-home tests per month. Um, they're working on Medicare doing that as well. There are also 20,000 free testing sites. Um, a lot of those are pharmacies. Um, and so those are places, there, there are a bunch of places where you can do that. Um, there's also some increased federal support for testing in schools. So hopefully more schools will be starting to do more testing. Um, and then they're in the month. So they've been ramping up production of these tests every month. Um, and so in the month of January, there were um, 375 million at home tests available for purchase um, just on the market. So there's kind of increasing availability. And I'm just going to note, I, I do think that, I don't think that Flagstaff Unified School District has the best um, COVID protocols. <laughs> um, but however, I do like that um, you can actually sign up for weekly testing for your student. So we okay. did sign up my niece for that. So I, I'm not sure what day they do it, but that gave me some comfort knowing like on a weekly basis, we'll at least know whether she is uh, transmissible uh, or has COVID and is symptomatic and, and contagious. So um, so I, I'm just saying if you should check with your school district and see what kind of options they have, because they may, now that they have more access to the rapid test, this may be an option that the school can do. Um, and this certainly gives me some comfort. They, they would not allow though, when she got sick and sent home from school, they wouldn't send home rapid tests for us. They only tested her on site, which I found a little frustrating, but um, I don't know, that's maybe a point of advocacy for, um, for us. And if we don't have that in our schools already. So yeah, you. I think a lot of the schools are just like, seeing like what do the parents want what will they get upset about what will they you know allow what do they you know so i think any advocacy is helpful on that front yeah i i sadly missed the school board meeting last night uh, they're like oh man i need they need a voice that's not like don't make our kids wear masks <laughs> 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 um, speaking of masks, since Omicron is so much like spread so much more quickly, um, a cloth mask is still much better than no mask. A surgical mask is, mask is better than a cloth mask. And then a respirator mask, so an N95, a KN95, a KF94, that's kind of the highest level of protection. Um, so that's, you know, good for, you know, if you're, you're in kind of a crowded indoor space. Um, or you're on an airplane or, you know, various settings um, where you might feel like, oh, I just need a little extra protection. Um, the federal government is distributing 400 million N95 masks through community health centers and pharmacies. Um, and they are also, I know they're working with sort of like sort of tribal areas to make sure that, that uh, both the tests and the masks are, are, are going to be distributed um, as well, um, if there well, aren't. I guess I have a question on that. So there were, was it 500, million um, rapid tests that were being sent out mm -hmm. and that was, so every household would get one so i'm just wondering i mean they're handing out from what i've read recently at the pharmacies three at a time and it seems like three per person um and it's not really by household um and 400 million is less than 500 million and if everyone's getting three um I, I guess I'm just confused I would think we would need more masks than we need rapid tests and like do you know what the thinking was behind that or uh, and the distribution model I, I just especially now that I know that the postal service works so well I'm just wondering why they didn't use a similar um, model for mailing out the masks. Yeah, they, what they were seeing was that the demand for for these masks was 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 not the same as tests. Where you know, every household, not every household wants tests, but more people were sort of looking to get tests from the federal government than looking to get masks. Um, so I think that was that was why they decided to it's to just really make it interesting. That's, yeah. yeah, that's very insightful. Do I have any more slides? I think that's it for slides. Should I stop sharing my screen? Um, yeah, and, and I have some questions on the masks. So you talked about the respirators um, and um, I mean, one of the really important things about the respirators is the right fit, right? Like it has to be, has like a suction, a sealed fit in order to work, right? And so 
I know they're kind of annoying to wear because you feel like you're Darth Vader or something when you breathe. Like the mask, the mask goes in and out. Uh, <laughs> and it's not as easy to breathe as it is with the cloth mask, but that's kind of how you know that it's working, right? Yeah. Yeah, that the air is not escaping out the sides or yeah. like the, like, you know, you kind of pinch down the nose wire so it doesn't get yeah. escape out, out that way either. But I will say that my KN95s, and I, I'll just be honest, I don't know if they are legit KN95s, um, but I find them really comfortable. And you can actually now get them in, in pretty nice colors. Um, like I have some that are kind of like a burgundy color and blue, dark blue. Um, so the availability is certainly higher. Uh, I usually get mine through Amazon um, because there for a while it was just so hard to get them on the shelves. It seemed like the demand for KN95s and N95s really spiked as soon as the country learned about Omicron. Well, it took about a month for people to really wake up to that. But I would say like late December, the demand was just off the charts. Um, but, but there is guidance by the CDC on how to select the right, um, the right masks. And I don't know if you have any pointers on that, Dr. Chen, in terms of knowing that the mask that you're purchasing is, is really, um, is, is not a fake N95 or KN95. I hope the Department of Justice is aggressively pursuing people who are selling these fakes. <laughs> Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's so wrong. <laughs> if you have any, because I, I looked at that guidance and it was just like, you know, it's overwhelming all of the different little things like the NIOSH number and like, it's just like, okay, my brain just stopped working. This is too much. Like, I need a, a dump down checklist that I can like literally carry to my my box of masks and like check off these things. But if there's a little a shorter, more simplified guidance that you can share, I, I think we'd love to hear that. <laughs> yes, you know, I'm trying to find, um, there's this, <laughs> this is gonna sound a little funny. There's this person named Aaron Collins who's known as the mask nerd who has been like testing all the different masks, verifying the, the manufacturers. And he's kind of like, everyone's sending it, like, this is the one, like all the like public health people are all sending people to like the mask nerds, like Google spreadsheet. Um, he has links to um, the, the, the places where you can buy these masks, both for adults and, and kids. Oh. Um, there's also a website, uh, projectn95.org, and they have links to all of the, the different masks. Um, it is overwhelming. Um, before this program came out, I said, okay, I'm going to get some N95s. I went to the 3M website and I just looked it up and then went to the Amazon link from there. So I knew like that link has to be legit because it came straight from 3M. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I needed to just switch to 3M as much as I, yeah. <laughs> but but it, yeah, I think that's a good strategy. So yeah, but the N95, we have shared that on our website, not probably as prominently. It's usually like in the comments when we're posting something about masks, but we'll go ahead and elevate that. And then we'll look up this uh, mask nerd to see what we can <laughs> find from his resources. Thank you for noting That's that. Good. I will also say that, you know, my the, the 3M N95 that I wore, like I'm only going to wear that in like very specific situations because it's really a tight fit. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to breathe through, but like, man, it's like kind of pinching here. Um, and so like the most, the most important thing is to wear the mask that you'll wear. Um, if that is a cloth mask, that's the one that's comfy that you can scrunch into your purse and like, that's the one you're gonna use then like wear that one. Um, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a respirator, like use, use that. So it's, it's really just important that you um, are able to just consistently wear that mask. It fits over your, your, your mouth and nose. Yeah, and, and um, that is what I've been hearing from like, um, Rochelle Walensky and just, and we we're trying to get that message out to folks, like just make sure you're wearing, like <laughs> any mask is better than no mask. Um, but, but there are some cool things that are out there. Like um, I have these things called ear savers because my ears are really sensitive to the masks. I'm not like used to, and I wear glasses too. So it's like, I have my glasses sitting there and then the, now I have something pulling. Um, and so these ear savers are amazing. You just like put it behind your head and it pulls the mask back. And then like your ears are free. And it's just like, 
you know, I was like, wow, this is such a cool invention. You can wear your mask all day long and your ears don't have any bother. And then it also makes the masks, you can get a really good seal on the mask um, because you can like pull it tight without having to like tighten your strings around your ears and then they fall off. And, um, and then now there are these cool things that's like an, another seal that you can put over your mask to have a better fit. I haven't tried that yet, but I'm curious how that's, that's going. But, and then the other thing, Dr. Chen, is we recommend to people, because I feel like there was a lot of concern from people, like I really want the N95s or the KN95s and people were concerned because of cost or um, just lack of, of access because the shelves were cleared. Um, and um, so, you know, cause there, there really aren't opportunities to buy these masks on the reservation in the, cause really the main purchase point there are grocery stores. There are no pharmacies that I'm aware of other than IHS facilities or tribal healthcare facilities. Um, and so a lot of our people will travel off reservation and try to find these things in, in pharmacies, but that's like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people <laughs> that are adding to the consumer market in these off-reservation communities. And so, you know, you can imagine like the, the situation of having empty shelves in those communities. And, and I was definitely was seeing that at um, the local Walgreens and CVSs here in Flagstaff for a period of time. I've just stopped venturing out altogether because things are so nuts. But when I was trying to find stuff that my family needed, um, I, I was noticing those barren shelves for those really important items. And, and just, we've seen the chatter from our constituents. So what we recommend is the, um, the, the cloth over the surgical mask. Um, if you cannot get the KN95 or the N95 and you wanna be as protective as possible, um, because especially the multi-layer cloth mask, because um, the, the KN95 at least is five layers. I think the N95 is as well. I mean, it's not the same kind of layering, but you can get five layers with the three ply surgical mask, uh, which is really effective. And then also adding a couple of cloth layers as well. I don't know, Dr. Chen, if you've heard anything further about the efficacy of the double masking or if you have any pointers on that. Yes. So, I mean, exactly what you said, having a surgical mask and then a, a well-fitted um, cloth mask on top is a, is a good alternative for sure. Um, and then of course, you know, masks are part of the, part of the equation, but you know, the, you know, obviously the vaccines, um, but fresh air, having ventilation, um, and for the most part, if you're outdoors and it's not crowded, like you don't have to wear a mask. You can just take that off, breathe free. I see a lot of people who mask and I'm like, I'm not sure why you're wearing a mask outside. There's nobody around you. Um, so I do also want to reassure you that like, uh, you know, even during a surge, the great outdoors is, is, is a good place to just sort of be free. Um, I'm starting to feel like I'm one of those people who will be wearing the mask outside. <laughs> um, but especially early on, because we just didn't like all of the science was evolving so quickly. We didn't really know what exactly was real. Things were constantly changing. Um, but but I, I do feel encouraged by a lot of the reporting I've been hearing about ventilation and like being outdoors in the air. But I, I am still hearing like, you don't want, you have to watch your distance still, right? Um, and, and don't like stand right in front of someone for a prolonged period of time if you're not wearing masks. Um, but yeah, I, I have, to, I, 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 I think I'm getting more comfortable with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all an adjustment, <laughs> figuring out what's safe, what's not safe. Yeah. See, yeah. Especially with Omicron, because, you know, I hear all these stories of people saying like, we have been so careful, like they're like disinfecting their groceries, you know, and they still are getting Omicron. It's like, how is this happening? Um, so it's like, man, I don't know what is really happening. So I'm going to be like super, super careful right now. Um, I'm, I'm one of those holdouts, you know, that's like, there are these really funny things on social media for people who haven't yet had COVID. And I'm totally one of those people, like, just like hiding from COVID. <laughs> Like, I, I will admit I'm, I'm mostly in that camp too I mean I think especially because we both have unvaccinated kids right, exactly. right? it just exactly. it just changes the way you think about you absolutely. know your risk absolutely yeah, yeah. It's like I cannot wait cannot wait maybe what I heard last was maybe next month but but you and I had talked about that a little bit and you were saying that they haven't yet finished their trials um so we don't know like how things are going to sort out and it's 
it, I was hearing it could be three doses to get sort of the initial round for the kiddos, the little ones, um, but yeah. yeah. I mean, we'll, if, if it follows the pattern from before, they'll announce that they have good results. And then a week or two later, they'll announce what those results were. And then a few weeks after that, they'll submit it to the FDA. And then it'll take a couple of weeks for the FDA to go through all of the data um, to figure it out. And then the CDC has to agree. So it, once once the news hits, then we'll know sort of like there are a few weeks to go and then we can get the, the little ones vaccinated. And I don't know if our viewers are aware, and we'll post this link in our um, in our chat, but the Navajo Nation Department of Health is now making the vaccination data available broken down by um, age demographics. And what's really striking is how few of our five to 12 year olds are vaccinated. Um, and, you know, Dr. Chen, I, I know you have a school age child who is eligible for um, for the vaccine and it, what, what what kind of thinking did you go through when you were deciding whether or not to vaccinate your child yeah i mean i think you know the younger your kid the more you're weighing everything and looking at all the different details i mean people said before the data came out about the five to eleven year old vaccines people said are you going to vaccinate your kid and i said i have to see the data first it may be like my life at the moment my job to get people vaccinated but like this is my kid i need to see that like the the benefits outweigh the risks, um, and so really looked very carefully at all of that, and it and it, it was it was clear that you know my kid's risk if he got COVID, um, which is like very likely with all these you know more and more transmissible variants um, around, um, that he was at much higher risk of having all of these different complications that you can have from COVID. You know you know certainly hospitalization and death, but like things that are not quite so severe of like the myocarditis you can get from, um, from, from having COVID, the long COVID symptoms, all the things that could happen to him um, versus the vaccine, which was much, much safer um, and, and, and gave him a better chance of being able to sort of sail through this pandemic. And so he said, okay, the data looks good. We're taking our kid. Um, now, how excited he was to get a shot in his arm <laughs> is another story. But afterward, we gave him a certificate and said, I'm a vaccine superhero. I'm fighting the pandemic. And he's just, it's on this bridge. He's so proud of that, that certificate. He got a second one. He got a second shot. So he's a, a very happy camper now. I, you know, when the kid vaccine for the 5 to 12 year old became available, it was so beautiful seeing all of those pictures on my social media feed of people taking photographs of their kids getting the shots and the kids were just so proud and they were like so happy that they could do play some role and like be this little health superhero you know like this little five-year-old um is, is is willing to make the sacrifice to make the community safer and it's just such a beautiful thing to see um Absolutely. so yeah that. I went through a very similar um, analysis because it was kind of the same thing, like as the kid um, trials were proceeding and it seemed like we might actually get something in like December, I was like, holy cow, do I really want to get my <laughs> guy like this, this is a big deal. Um, but it was kind of the same thing. It was like one of the big hesitancies um, is, um, you know, like the, the myocarditis um, and it was just like, yeah, like, okay, so you're weighing the risk of them getting, you know, inflammation through myocarditis or from the vaccine. So like, well, there's the risk of inflammation on the, the non-vaccine side and there's possible long COVID and <laughs> we still don't really know what the long-term health effects of, of getting COVID are because we've never really seen anything like this. So I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to go with the vaccine. Um, you know, I, I was vaccinated as a child. I had no say in the matter and it turned out well. <laughs> I trust our, our doctors and our scientists. And um, yeah, I, I definitely want to make sure my little guy is protected. And just the stress of like the certainty that at some point each of us are going to get COVID. It's probably going to happen. Like, I definitely want my little guy to have the protection of a vaccine um, because I just, you know, like he gets little sniffles here and there and has trouble breathing with that. And I'm just like, 
I don't think I could handle something where he has serious congestion. It would just be so hard. So hard, true. Yeah, and I know that there are there are so many myths and rumors that are spreading about you know the the vaccines and and particularly in kids. I think you know the 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 rates of vaccination among the the, the young kids in Navajo Nation is pretty similar to what it is nationally. It's kind of in the like twenty to thirty range, which is like really quite low. Um, I know a lot of people have been you know there's been a lot of rumors floating around about fertility. Um, and the, you know, the vaccine is going to affect your child's fertility and your fertility. And those, the, the, the anti-vaccine um, kind of industry has been spreading those rumors about the HPV vaccine, about the hepatitis B vaccine. They, they just sort of like pulled out their playbook and used it on COVID um, and then sort of used sort of like everybody's anxiety to spread it. Um, even further, but there is no evidence that this vaccine or any vaccine in the past has caused any fertility issues among boys or girls. Um, there's the vaccine goes into your body and revs up your immune system and it goes poop. It's sort of your body chews it up and it's gone within a couple of days. Um, so the, the, the likelihood of there being kind of some long-term effect that appears years down the line is just, it's just not something that scientists feel like is, 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 is feasible. Um, and so certainly, you know, the threat at hand is, is COVID and that vaccine is the safest way to protect our kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really sad when you look at the Navajo stats. Um, Mahayu, I, I actually probably could share the information on my screen um, if you give me um, co-host approval. Let me see if I can pull it up. But it's really interesting. Um, and it, let's see if I can share my screen. Oh, yeah, I can do it. Um, so yeah, you can see for the five to 11, 32%, 70% for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And then um, kind of what I think is the millennial age range, it, it might be wrong now. Uh, I, I know for sure I'm at the cutoff. So, you know, this is definitely millennials here. <clears throat> I'm not sure what these guys were called right here, 20 to 24 year olds. Um, but you know that those are kind of our those were our longstanding low vaccination demographics, um, and these folks. I'm actually surprised when we talk to people for our public health education program. Um, it, more than ninety percent, more than ninety five percent of people we talk to are fully vaccinated in the, the 40, 40 to sixty five year old and over age range. Um, so I, I'm surprised these numbers are not more than ninety percent. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like, you see that these guys are not as highly vaccinated. Um, and then when you look at the data in terms of, um, who's getting sick, they break that down by age groups as well. It is, you know, a lot of the, the school age children, and of course they weren't vaccinated for a period of time. And then a lot of these millennials, again, very high compared to the other, to the more highly vaccinated population rates. And then when you compare the death rates though, you know, it's, it's, it's in our elders, um, 60 and over. So, you know, <laughs> I think sometimes it's hard to understand um, our, our younger people here are healthier and they, they feel like they can take on more risk, but um, I, I, I just encourage young people to please get vaccinated because it does have an impact on our broader community and it is having a disproportionate adverse impact on our elders, uh, unfortunately, who's, you know, the, the vaccine only boosts someone's natural immunity and our elders are starting from a lower baseline and many of them have comorbidities with diabetes or, um, you know, a, a history of cancer, high blood pressure. Um, so it's super, super important just to protect the community, you know, making that decision about the vaccine isn't just a decision about what is going to happen to you uh, or your family. It, it really affects the broader community, especially if you have school-aged children who are, you know, um, in your home and then off to school. So if, if your household contracts it, then they, they take it to school and then it goes to other households that may have higher risk um, family members as well. So please, please remember to think about protecting the community more broadly. Um, but 
yeah, I, those stats are always so insightful, I think. And we're, we're constantly asking for more data. Uh, you know, like our, our most recent request is to be able to get that data on a chapter by chapter basis. Um, I didn't show you the, the map showing the, um, the spread rates, but um, you know, like we've seen Chinle chapter always having like off the chart numbers and they're centrally located on Navajo. And, and I always wonder like, why, why do they seem to have such a high disproportionate rates? Um, and some of it we can explain when you see like the community spread map and then you do an overlay of the map of um, where the, the greatest number of households without running water are. And there is a lot of overlap. And we have some communities where over 250 households don't have running water. Um, and actually among our constituents, you know, where we have, even in situations where we have really high subscription rates, uh, where like most of the people in the community are, have requested assistance from us, um, you know, we're seeing like 60% and over um, in the community don't have running water. Um, so that definitely has an impact. Uh, and also is further why we need vaccines because we're facing these development challenges that other communities are not facing that makes our community more disproportionately vulnerable. Um, but yeah, so, but I will say that there are some bright shining lights out there. Like we, we recently spoke with someone from uh, an, an all Navajo Nation school district and their high school students were like 97% fully vaccinated. Um, yeah, so it was, it was like, oh wow, those kids should get some kind of an award because they really are taking that concept of protecting community to heart. Um, yeah. I love that. I love that. And like, they're, they're setting such a good example for like all their peers and for everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's some some really great stories out there. People doing incredible work to, to protect our communities um, for sure. But well, let's see if we have any questions from um, oh, here we do. We have some questions from the, um, the viewers. Okay, let's see. Question from Wendy. We hear from unvaccinated, from the unvaccinated concern over how fast the vaccines were developed. Um, can you please uh, share some, um, some, shed some light on, on that process for development? Yes, absolutely. Um, so the vaccines were developed quickly and thank goodness because there are estimates that the vaccines have saved over a million lives in the US alone um, just because they, they got into arms before Delta hit and now before kind of Omicron hit. Um, so definitely lives are being saved even before Alpha hit, I think, before the, 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 the UK variant. Um, so the vaccines were developed in, in some ways sort of like quickly from the kind of start of the pandemic to getting shots in arms. Um, it was really a combination of kind of three things like preparation, um, luck, <laughs> and resources. Um, so vaccine scientists have been like more aware than the normal rest of us that like it was very likely that a coronavirus, not, not COVID-19, but a coronavirus was going to cause a pandemic um, just because of like sort of what they understand about viruses. Um, so they've been, they've been working on developing this mRNA technology has been under development for a few decades, um, both for kind of pandemics, for like other medical uses as well. And um, we're just like waiting to like, sort of like be able to plug in like, okay, there's a virus that we need to like, you know, mass produce a, a vaccine for. And so there's a lot of preparation that's been happening like behind the scenes before any of us knew there was going to be a pandemic in this, in this time frame. Um, the luck piece is that it just so happened that as COVID was sort of like showing up on the scene, the pieces had kind of come together so that it was, it was ready to, you know, the time it took from like when the, the genetic sequence of that virus came out sort of like globally to when the first like first trial participant got a shot in their arm was about two, two months, which is, uh, would not have happened. There's no way it would have happened without all those decades of preparation. Um, so we got lucky. Um, and then the, 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 the final piece of resources, I mean, which is sometimes, huge. <laughs> sometimes I worry about like, you know, the funding that our federal government's investing in research. But I would say this is an example of why that's so important. 
we have that tool ready. <laughs> totally. And then the resources. So like everybody who knows anything about vaccine development, like they dropped whatever they were doing and they were like, this is what I'm going to focus on. And part of why they were able to do that was because governments were like, have some billions of dollars because this pandemic is killing people. It's killing the economy. It is like a total disaster for everybody. We need to get a vaccine ASAP. And so through sort of billions of dollars of development uh, money so that sort of like research was able to proceed at like much quicker pace than normally, um, you know, getting these clinical trials underway and like recruiting sort of like people to join. Um, so it was like the money, the, the resources to be able to sort of like start, um, start, um, uh, manufacturing the vaccine. So usually a vaccine, once you figure out it works, then it gets a green light and then you start manufacturing it. So like when it gets approved, there are like a few boxes. Um, the federal government said, we're going to buy a whole bunch of all of the vaccines, the ones that might work, the ones, you know, hoping that one or two or three will work. Um, and so they, they started manufacturing all of them. Um, and so, you know, the day that Pfizer said, you know, we have good data and, and FDA and CDC said, good, like go, like the next day there were millions of vaccines on trucks, like going out because they were already manufactured. Um, and part of it was also like people stepped up and said, I want to be in this trial, right? Like how, how, like, I saw so many people that I know saying like, I'm signing up for the trial. I've never heard that on any other clinical trial. Any, so you don't even know that they're happening. They're just sort of like in like hospitals and health systems and research places. But so many people stepped up around the world actually to say like, we wanna be part of the solution. Like, give me that shot. I will be a part of this solution. Um, and so it was very, it was, it was much quicker than usual to get people to participate. So for all of these reasons, we ended up getting vaccines faster than, than anyone anticipated um, because like we put like really concentrated um, effort uh, into it beforehand and, and, and during the whole development. That's, really That's my nice. very long answer, but I get very excited about this particular question. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I, that was wonderful. Um, and you know, luck is always, <laughs> An important factor to have on your side. <laughs> so, yes, it was. <laughs> um, oh dear. We do have a question about natural immunity. Um, and that question is how long does it last? Yes. So when people say natural immunity, typically, I think what it's referring to is you've got COVID. Now, how long are you immune from, from getting COVID again? Um, so, you know, typically we've been, you know, everybody is different <laughs> as part of the problem. Some people, their natural immunity might last for a long time, um, for years. Some people, it might last only for like three months. Um, and there's not a great way of knowing sort of who's in which bucket. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the additional curveball that's happened is with these new variants. Um, if you had the original virus, you know, two years ago, you're not as protected against Delta. You're, you know, much less protected against the Omicron. Um, and so with these new variants, that natural immunity doesn't really sort of like, doesn't provide you as much protection as getting the vaccine plus the booster. That gives you kind of the most sort of like surround sound um, protection. Your body's been revved up one, two, three times um, to say like, okay, like this is, this is something I need to be ready to fight in the future. Um, and so natural immunity, it's, it, it, it does help bolster your, your immunity against COVID, um, but it is not enough on its own. That's interesting. And that, you know, we saw that Israel was going to have a, a fourth vaccine. I don't know where they are on that now, um, but, but there is a fourth shot out there. There's a, a second booster, I guess. And some people are getting that who are immunocompromised, even here in the United States. Um, what does the vaccination outlook look like, do you think? I mean, I'm hearing lots of conversation of like from the Pfizer, uh, he was the CEO saying, we're trying to get to that point where we just have a, an annual booster. Um, and, and another slightly separate question, um, you know, there's lots of talk about moving into an endemic where we're not like trying to stop COVID necessarily. We're trying to learn how to live with it and because it's so pervasive. Um, and so I would be curious to know like fourth shot slash, you know, are we moving towards an annual vaccine? Um, are we all gonna need to be getting that fourth shot in the next three months? I would love it if it's available. <laughs> um, 
but and then, and then you know are we moving to an endemic i know we were talking about that before delta and omicron and then they just kind of threw everything off um but yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts yeah so in terms of the shot so israel is doing a fourth shot um for their their whole population um but the data so far is not showing that like the fourth shot does you does a whole lot of good um in addition to the third shot so that booster already gets you up to like 88 90 percent protection against hospitalization and death which is about where we were with the original series um and so you're still getting like very very good protection um from that booster so right now like we're not looking at getting like another booster the only population that's different is if you are like if your immune system is like wiped out from like a blood cancer or particular medications that you take um then your your original your primary series instead of two shots is three shots and then you get your booster kind of five months after that so you get you, you have one booster still you just got sort of an extra shot with your primary series um, will we need a, a COVID vaccine every year? Who knows? Um, right now, we just we just don't have the data to tell us sort of how our immune systems are are reacting to these um, these uh, vaccines and you know what is going to happen with variants. Um, so that's all very up in the air. In terms of the endemic, so I mean, I, I, there's not going to be kind of a moment where we're like, aha, we went endemic. <laughs> it's going to be a process and we were already sort of like on that sort of like process like this omicron wave has been like it's been crazy everyone's been getting infected it's been like disrupted everything but like so many people are vaccinated we have you know so many people have been able to get tested i mean remember in march of 2020 nobody could get tested um and now, even a year ago it was like hard to get a test and now like there's so many tests that like you know, that are you know increasingly available so you can figure out whether you have covid you can isolate and not give it to people um, around you we have these masks more availability of good masks and everyone owns a mask now whereas none of us owned a mask a couple of years ago um, we have new treatments that are available for people who are high risk um, so you know some people like even with the vaccines and everything they they just they just don't develop immunity and so like we have like really good um uh, new drugs that are that are being used for people who are high risk to keep them out of the hospital and keep them from having bad outcomes. So like we are on that path um, toward um, COVID not disrupting our life so much. Um, I think we're not there yet. 150,000 people in the hospital is like a lot of people. 2,000 people a day dying is just way too many people. Um, but I think we are getting there with every surge. Like we're just, we have more immunity from vaccines. We have more immunity from people, you know, unfortunately getting back, uh, getting infected. Um, and so as kind of a, a, a in, in our country and sort of like the, the, the globe, we will see COVID. Um, causing less and less disruption. There will still be surges. We will still see that, but we'll be so much better at dealing with it um, and managing it. Um, and so we are moving like closer and closer to a day when we can, you know, not think about COVID all the time and just go out and live our lives and get together with people we love and go to concerts and all those wonderful things that we like to do. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. I miss those times. <laughs> It, and, you know, the global vaccination um, rate factors into that, of course, and like Definitely. the absence of equal access to vaccines globally gives the um, the variants opportunity to develop. Um, I mean, do we, are things looking better on that front? Do we anticipate a more, like, is, is there going to be like a threshold that we're approaching with the global vaccination rate that will create more safety for all of us? I mean, we're, we're at about 62% of the global population has gotten one shot, which means like yeah, over 3 billion of people have not gotten a shot yet. Um, and, and so we're not, we're not there yet. Um, there's like the entire continent of Africa, like a lot of it is like, very severely under under vaccinated um, for very for many many different reasons including supply um, so i think you know it's going to take a few years um, i mean how long it takes really depends on how much willpower there is among um you know countries like ours and 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 europe and other places to like step up and say that's it like we have to vaccinate everybody if we want to all get out of this together so that that is definitely an important piece of it and then we do have another question um, asking 
is hand washing effective against Omicron? Yes, yes. The, the 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 virus that you know is even even as it mutates, it's 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 the virus is kind of surrounded. Its skin is kind of like a bubble of fat, and like you know what happens to fat when you have soap on it, it goes. Pfft. Um, and so the hand washing is 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 continues to be very effective, and that won't change even if it's a different variant. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we just encourage people keep following those same safety precautions. They're no fun. They sound boring. They sound too simple to be effective, but they are. <laughs> <Of course, laughs> vaccines and boosters are the most effective protection. All those other things do work. Um, and um, you know, one thing that, that we're aware of is transmission through different um, points of the body. Like there's a lot of focus on the nose and the mouth, um, but we also understand that it can come in through your eyes. Is, is there anything on that? And why is there less focus on preventing that as a, an access point for transmission? Yeah, I mean, it, it is possible. Um, I mean, your eyes are less likely to transmit the virus because there's not, you know, all the nose and mouth sort of like things, <laughs> saliva and secretions and things. Um, you know, in, in high risk situations, people wear that face shield. Um, if they're, you know, working in an ICU and they're like, you know, intubating somebody, putting them on a ventilator, like they have to wear that face shield. Um, for the, but for the most part, I think like if you're going to the grocery store, if you're out and about, like you, I think the, the, the mask and the, and your vaccine, that's, that's sufficient, um, protection. And I guess just some musings. I mean, I just, I feel so bad for the healthcare workers, you know, they're like right there on the front line. Some of them are having to reuse PPE because of shortages um, or come to work while sick. Um, I mean, some of them are striking, some of them are quitting. Like, what does that outlook look like? It's been really, really rough. It's been a really hard two years for healthcare workers, um, particularly people who work in the hospitals and are seeing, and, and like there are a lot of places where like they get yelled at for like suggesting that like, I'm gonna take care of your COVID. No, I don't have COVID. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, we are seeing a lot, of, definitely seeing people quitting and people sort of getting totally burnt out. I think the more that healthcare workers see that the public is still behind them and is taking our, our precautions when there is a surge um, and that they're like, their efforts matter, um, the more we're able to get people vaccinated. Um, so people aren't showing up dying of things, something that they didn't have to die of. Um, I think things will get better. And as, as we, as, as we get better and better at dealing with these surges and fewer and fewer people end up in the hospital and dying, like it will get better for the healthcare workforce. Um, but, you know, my hope is that, you know, there will be more and more people sort of coming through the ranks who have seen like, wow, like pandemic, like healthcare is a great sort of field to go into, especially from um, communities that are underrepresented in, in healthcare. Indigenous communities are, are huge on that, on that front that we have sort of more people who represent communities showing up in our, in our halls of, of healthcare to take care of our communities. So that's one sort of like side effect that I, that I hope, <laughs> that I hope will happen uh, because of the pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's definitely happening in my family. My niece decided she wants to be a nurse. And of course, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the worst time. But <laughs> <laughs> in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, she, she would make a much better lawyer, um, but she thinks she wants to do this. So <laughs> she may be on that path here in the next couple of years. Um, but well, thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, yeah, it was really great having you here and just like, always so amazing to to hear um, your updates through Made to Save and um, have you as a resource and as an advocate in our corner when we're trying to get equal access to federal resources, federally dispensed resources for our community members. So thank you so much for, for doing that and for being here with us today. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being here and for all you're doing and hope everyone stays safe and healthy and happy. Um, great. Well, everyone have a beautiful day. And Dr. Chen, we hope to have you back soon. But Sounds talking good. about how, how wonderful a job we've, we've done of getting ahead of COVID. <laughs> Indeed, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. All right. Take care. Okay.